Turn your Bibles, please, to Philippians 3. We're, we're going to go back to take another look at the passage we began to look at two Sundays ago. Just to remind you of the order. On the 24th of January was my first opportunity to be back with you preaching here. Uh, first opportunity to preach in 2016 to people that I love dearly. And I thought it would be good for us to think about 2016, what's ahead. And we got through a portion of that passage, and then we had the ordination last week. And so we come back to that passage today. And Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 21 is where we're looking. And I want to ask you just to stand with me briefly. And I know you've been up and down, but that's okay. It's, it's, it's all right to stand frequently before the Lord. Paul, we, remember we read our responsive reading a couple of weeks ago from the verses 1 through 11 leading up to this passage. Today we read the responsive reading in the passage that follows this. He's, he's arguing for how important it is to, to lean in to Jesus, to lean in to the Christian life, to, to press that it, it's not, the victory does not come passively. So follow along as I read this, beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears. Walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we wait, await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to himself. This is what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Never forget that. Never forget that. People mock this book today. They discount it. It's a, to, the, to the modern mind, it's a book of bigotries and, and outdated concepts, but oh, no, no. This is, this is the Word of God, every word of it. And it's sufficient. It has not lost its sufficiency even in these troubling times. May the Lord press these words to us today and help us to live as people of the book. Thank you. Be seated. Well, we began this passage, and I, I told you the, that to me it seems like it breaks down into five headings, five uh, observations. First, there's a need for us to have a right assessment of ourselves, as Paul did. We looked at that last time. Also, secondly, a right perspective of our lives. Third, a realistic necessity for our sanctification. We, we begin to cover that. We're going to take another look at that today and then move on to the last two. A, re, a, reali a really sad reality, even in the midst of all the glorious truths. And then finally, a redemptive reminder of our citizenship. If you remember last time I, I told you, when thinking about this right assessment of ourselves, uh, he does not imagine himself to have already obtained. It, it, that's, let that sink in again. He would end up writing, this is, about the, this is the, fourth of the, last, fourth of the last letter he, he writes, he would end up writing half of the New Testament. Surely if anybody could say they had arrived, the Apostle Paul could say, I've arrived. I've made it. Mm -mm. No. 
He didn't think that. He didn't think he was already perfected. He understood that sanctification is an ongoing process. Remember, justification is a one-time reality. Justification says, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification says, I am being saved from the power of sin. And glorification says, I shall be saved from the very presence of sin. Paul understands that as long as he's on this earth, breathing the atmosphere of, of terra firma, that he is in process, he is in progress, he is going from one stage of glory to another stage of glory, he is, he is learning increasingly how to deal with besetting sins. And he recognized the need to press on. It's, uh, I told you that word is the word, same word for persecute. It's, it's an intense pursuit. Just as he was persecuting the followers of Jesus, intensely pursuing them, having been saved by grace through faith, he now uses that same energy to intensely pursue the Lord. Not to kill him this time, but to know him. To know him. And he does recognize the importance of, of finally laying hold of Jesus, who, when he saved Paul and when he saved you and me, laid hold of us by grace. He also understood that this intense response, this, this, that in, intense Christianity was the inevitable response of someone who was convinced that Jesus Christ had done everything necessary to make him his own. My friend R.F. Gates used to use the illustration. He said, you know, he said, a lot of Christianity that's talked about today is like, step over the line. Okay, you're there. It's not a step over the line. It's walk, a journey. It's not a step, it's a journey. All the way to the end. It's coming to the point where you face that river that has no bridge. And you cross over it into the promised land, into, into heaven. Well, we need to have a right perspective of our lives. We talked about that last time. This, to know what we should forget and know what we should never forget. We never forget our conversion experience. We never can forget those high points, those, those Ebenezers that, that crop up for us in the journey, but there are some things we need to forget. We need to forget the disappointments, the discouragements. We need to forget our failures. Remember that they too are washed in the blood of the Lamb. So he has a redemptive reflection upon his past. He, he knows how to forget and remember the things that lie behind. And he knows that his energies, here's the, here's the, here's the main, his energies have got to be focused and spent on what lies ahead. I think some people unwittingly let the enemy of our souls bind us up with our past and get us preoccupied with what lies behind so that we, we miss what is now and what is coming, what is ahead. Paul would have us do the exact opposite. What lies ahead. And I mentioned to you John Piper's book. I would encourage you. I commend it to you. I hope you'll get it and read it. Future Grace. Future Grace. It's the, it's the application of his life thesis that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. If you think about our sin troubles that we have, they typically come, you can trace these back, when we have some level of dissatisfaction or discontentment with, with the Lord God himself and with the blessings we're receiving or we think we ought to receive and we're not receiving, the blessings that come by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So we looked at those, those things. We began looking at this realistic necessity for our sanctification. He says in verses 15 to 17, let those of us who are mature think this way. In other words, he says, if you disagree with me, I'm not upset, it just shows that you're immature. 
And he says, God, will, you, you, keep, you keep searching. God will show it to you. Only let us, that is the mature, let us who, who see this, who read this, who embrace this, say, this, what you're talking about is true, Paul. Let us hold true to what we have attained. What's he talking about there? He's, you see, Paul, and he's going to talk about some of these folks in the next verses, had seen people make professions of faith in Christ and maybe leap like jackrabbits out of the starting gates and fizzle, lose heart, go back to Judaism. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is written about. Warning professing Christians, do not turn your back on Christianity and go back to Judaism. Christ is superior to anything you'll find in Judaism. That's the message of Hebrews. Let us, he says, hold true to what we've attained. And then he gives this strong exhortation. When you read this and you think, could we, see, could we say this to people? We should be able to. Brothers, join in imitating me. Now, not as an end in itself, because he says in another place, follow me as I follow Christ, or imitate me as I imitate Christ. To the extent, to the extent that I am pursuing Christ's likeness, to the extent that I am, I am longing to know him, to know the power that is found in a relationship with Christ. We've been talking about that in, in the Wednesday studies. You've, if you haven't been there, you've missed a wonderful study of, uh, of, of prayer and and all that comes with that and what, what the fruit of abiding has just been great and refreshing to my own soul to be there for part of that. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Now, let me say to every adult believer here, that means that a mom or dad ought to be able to point to your life and say to their children, Follow the example of Mr. So-and-so. Follow the example of Miss So-and-so. That's heavy. But it's what he's saying. Not just imitate him, but keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. What's, what's, what's he talking about there? He's talking about disciple making. Imitate me, but also Im watch those who are imitating me. Watch, watch how it's trickling down, how it's going from one generation to the next. The example you have in us, watch those who are, who are modeling that same example. He's confident that what he's saying is objectively true. It's not a subjective feeling that he has. Ponder, brothers and sisters, what needs to happen in our lives. You know, the little, little thing, if, if every church member was just like me, what kind of church would this be? The fourth thing, a really sad reality. This, this is where he... It's so important to follow his example. It's so important to take his words to heart. It's so important to follow the example of others who are following his example. So those disciples that are being made, those disciple makers, it's so important because he says, for many, and it's tragic, he doesn't say a few, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. This was not a small thing to Paul. and He was not, he was not distant from it. He was not dispassionate about it. I tell you with tears, many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. He doesn't say that they, that they have become sworn enemies. They walk as enemies. In other words, their life, you look at their life and you would say they, they despise the cross. Because the first thing that comes being a follower of Jesus is self-denial. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me, Jesus said. And then he says this awful indictment. Their, their end is destruction. In other words, if, if a person, even, even a person who professes to be a Christian, lives as an enemy of the cross of Christ, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. In other words, they serve. It's all about them. 
about their needs being met, about, about them being satisfied. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. It's fascinating to me. You read about one public religious figure after another saying, well, we know we need to, uh, we need to rethink this uh, the attitude we have about uh, homosexuals and lesbians and whether or not a practicing homosexual and a practicing lesbian can be a Christian and be a member of a church. So there's, that chatter is going on all across Christendom, brothers and sisters. It breaks my heart. The glory in what should be shameful. Minds set on earthly things. And I think Paul is basically saying here, and this is the problem. They do not live with eternity in view. You know, we have a dual citizenship, and we're going to look at this citizenship thing. We are, by God's providence, citizens of the United States of America. But that's just, that's a temporary thing. By God's grace, we're citizens of another place, of another kingdom. Let's look at what he says. You see, when he talks about tears, these are people he loves. Perhaps people who had labored with him in the gospel. Perhaps people who had confessed, had come to know Christ under his ministry. It's painful to him. And so he gives this, uh, I've told you about this, uh, this powerful, redemptive, uh, adversative conjunction called but, B-U-T. Some place to use it where we were, we were this way, we were dead in trespasses and sins and on and on. And, but God, but God who's rich in mercy. Now, he uses this, this word again. But, that's how they are. Follow our example because there are some out there whose example I don't want you to follow. If you follow their example, you may, you may end in destruction like them. So follow the example of those who walk according to the word. Do not follow the example of those who do not walk according to the word. Because those folks are anchored here. They, I've told you this before when we were going through the book of the Revelation. There's this term that pops up several times, the inhabitants of the earth. And it's actually the Greek term, down dwellers. It means those who have got their roots firmly sunk here. Peter said, you're, you're, you're sojourners, you're, you're travelers. And one of the terms there he uses is the word side dweller. Paul's saying here, don't follow the down dwellers, follow the side dwellers, follow those who understand they, they live right alongside of, they walk right alongside of, but they understand that there's a bigger picture. They understand there's a bigger mission. That life is about more than getting all that I want and all that I need. Life's about more than being satisfied with what I want. Life is about being satisfied in Jesus, finding our chief contentment in Christ, being able to say, if I have Jesus, I have all that I need. So verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. Paul's a Roman citizen. He has a privilege that very few of the people that he speaks to have. He's preaching in places that are occupied by Rome. They're serfs. There are people who've been captured. Roman soldiers march up and down their street. Keep them in order. Paul's a Roman citizen. He, to, to, it'd be one thing for a person of another place from the churches in Galatia from the churches church in Ephesus and Philippi. It'd be one thing for some of those folks to think about this, but Paul's a Roman citizen. And he says, our citizenship is in heaven. You Philippians, take 
taken over as a region, first of the Jews, named for Philip. If you know Jesus, our citizenship is in heaven. And from heaven, we await a Savior. Well, there's a whole lot of chatter going on now. All these debates and this, that, and the other. And people are, you hear people talk, it's like they're looking for a Savior. Let me tell you something. You know this. There's not a person running for president who's our Savior. <laughs> Every one of them needs a Savior. You know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that some actually know the Savior. We await a Savior from heaven who has already saved us. He's already proven. He laid down His life for us. We await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we struggle, and Paul struggled. Romans 7, he struggled with, this, with remaining sin. It's no longer I that do it. It's the sin that dwells in me that's, that's manifesting this. He, was, he wasn't copying out. He's just saying, I know what I ought to do. I know what I ought to be. And yet, those things it seems like I leave undone. The things I know I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he comes to the conclusion of that argument. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice, we await a Savior who will transform our lowly body, these tabernacles that are decaying, transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body without spot or blemish. Oh, heaven. Heaven. The place where Jesus dwells, where we, we get to see the Lamb on the throne and spend eternity praising Him and fellowshipping with one another where every choice we have there is, is a good choice. No, no sinful choices. He'll do this by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. How sure is it that you and, and I, if we're followers of Christ, and even those I'm speaking to who are not yet followers of Christ, but who commit your life to Christ, how sure are we that we will be totally and completely transformed? See, sometimes the devil says, you'll, ne you'll never change. And sometimes he has, he has spokesmen tell us that. Look us in the eye. Of, you'll never change. But oh, if you know Jesus Christ, you absolutely will change. You are being changed. And the day will come when the final change takes place, the final transformation. How do we know that? Because that same power is going to bring everything under subjection. That same power is going to subdue all the enemies of God. Now you, read, you read the newspapers, you read about Putin discovering that Turkey is making plans perhaps to invade Syria and it, World War III is going to break out over there. Let me tell you something. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. But the King of Kings and Lord of Lords has the final say. And it's going to be for the saints a glorious final say. And it's going to be for His enemies a devastating final say. Remember where your citizenship is. You know, be, be good citizens of, of the U.S. Take those... Take those actions as good citizens do. Vote when you have the opportunity to vote. But remember, finally, your citizenship is in heaven if you know Jesus Christ. If you don't, if you don't, your end is destruction. You're anchored to this earth. And, and if, if I'm talking to you and you know that to be true about yourself, oh, that you would cry out to God, dear God, dislodge me from this earth. I don't want to be a down dweller. I don't want to have my roots sunk here and only here. I, make me by your grace a side dweller where, where I'm, I'm on my way to the celestial city. I'm, I'm on my way to a, to a city not made with human hands whose builder and maker is God. Lord, save me. Be my Savior.
But if He is your Savior, then follow Paul's example. And be an example that others can imitate. I was telling Norman Hare, we were talking about this, that Sinclair Ferguson preached a message about church growth, and he said, he said, you know all this needful for church growth? He said, it's for all the members to come all the time. He said, just all the members attend all the time. He said, he said if that's happening in a church, I promise you, word begins to get out. He said, church growth will take place. And he, he listed, you know, worship service, all the members in worship, all the members in the Bible studies. He said, particularly prayer meeting, all the members in prayer meeting. He said, when that, when that begins to happen and word begins to get out, that that, that church gathers, he said, growth is inevitable from that. And that's what kingdom citizens do. We, we plug into the opportunities that, most, that are most like where we're going to spend eternity. Right? I mean, if, the, if the saints are meeting, I'm talking about the, the saints of God, not the football team that didn't make it to the playoffs. If the saints are meeting, and you're looking forward to heaven, that's the closest thing to heaven you're going to have here. You ought to want to taste it. You ought to want to experience it. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, for someone whose citizenship is only here, I mean, you can understand the preoccupation of a person whose citizenship is only here, wanting to be caught up in all the things that just have to do with here. Well, let me challenge you, brothers and sisters. Want to see a church grow? Then plug into everything that will make you grow. And as you and I grow, God will honor that with growth. We'll be different, I promise you. So here, let me close with this just real quickly. I want you to know as we leave today that heaven will not be reached passively. Expending energies on a preoccupation with the things of this world. It'll be reached aggressively. There's a, Jesus tells in, in the Gospels about this man sitting and strong men standing and guarding away, and it's the way to heaven. And a fellow walks up and says, put down my name there, sir. And he draws his sword, and he clashes and, and fights his way through. And one of the Puritans wrote a book on the basis of that called Heaven Taken by Storm. I want you to feel as you leave here today the urgency of cultivating a straining, pressing on disposition. No coasting. I was talking with someone recently. I said, you know, if you're, if you're in a stream and the stream is going, the flow is this way, downhill, and you know you should be going upstream and you're, and you're treading water, you're going downstream. You're not staying there. The urgency. I want you to feel the urgency of cultivating a straining, pressing on disposition. The one thing we must do for 2016. And then I just appeal to you, if, you happen, if this happens to be true of you, I don't know, shake off the spiritual lethargy that too often besets us when we let the cares of life overwhelm us. One thing I do. Will you commit to that one thing? this year a new and a fresh one thing and see what God will do with the people who say we're forgetting what's behind those things that need to be forgotten and we're straining forward to those things that are ahead we're focused on that and looking forward to future grace the future manifestations of grace that we've never yet imagined that God will show to us will you join me in that Let's pray together.